They're all so genuinely excited for him. You did not seem to think that it was mirrored in Jason Tatum. Not a lot of great NBA teams. Is Boston one? I'm not sure. And to be honest, Celtics should have the advantage in that equation. They've got all their full team together. Because all they do is go one-on-one. -on -one. Absolutely. They got no ball moving, no body movement. They win games by strictly on talent. And that's not going to work. Boston doesn't have one since the 2008 season. And you're looking at them and you're saying, okay, it's been enough time now to knock on the door that much but can't get over the hump. Is Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown going to answer the call? It really, really comes down to that. What an NBA source just said. He said, Jalen Brown, it's not so much that he's underrated. It's that he's just not liked because of his, quote, I am better than you attitude. He knows it. It's the same reason he is not as marketable as he should be. That's what an NBA source just sent me. I don't know that to be the case. I like Jalen Brown. I know a lot of people that like Jalen Brown. But again, when you think about marketability, that's what that person was alluding to. In addition to those takes blatantly trying to split up and mercilessly disrespecting the Boston Celtics, the mainstream analysts who have picked against Boston include Nick Wright, Shaq, Richard Jefferson, Chris Broussard, LaShawn McCoy, Tim Legler, and Rick Buecher. Boston didn't have to face Miami's best player, Jimmy Butler, in the first round, Jarrett Allen for the entire second round, Karis LeVert for Game 5 of that series, and Cleveland's best player, Donovan Mitchell, for Games 4 and 5 of the conference semifinals. In the conference finals, Indiana's best player, Tyrese Halliburton, was missing for Games 3 and 4. Three of those games against the Pacers, specifically Game 1, where Indiana led by 3 points with the ball and 10 seconds left, could have easily gone the Pacers way. Toronto Raptors NBA champion and Cameroonian Pascal Siakam stepped up as the number one option, with Canadian Andrew Nemhard shocking the world, was good enough to keep the Pacers within three points of winning games three and four of the East Finals without their best player. The team those Pacers beat to advance and take on the Celtics was a completely banged up Knicks team whose entire main core was out with an injury or playing through a severe injury. However, for a Boston team that I've posted 14 videos on since last summer, people aren't fully acknowledging the fact that they got through the East playoffs in just 14 games, despite missing third option Chris Dapps Porzingis for most of the playoffs, as you heard ESPN's Bob Myers completely forget about in the intro. The lucky number 14 doesn't mean Boston's going to finally get over the hump in these finals glossing over the fact that the Celtics have faced weaker opponents than the Mavericks up to this point, or even trying to claim that Boston's faced tougher competition like some have tried to wouldn't be smart. Record-wise, the Eastern Conference was significantly worse than the Western Conference throughout the 2023-24-82 game grind. In the East, the Atlanta Hawks were 10 games under 500, yet good enough to make the play-in tournament as the 10th seed. In the West, the Golden State Warriors were 10 games over 500, yet had the same seeding as the Hawks, finishing as the 10th seed. The trading of Time Lord for Drew Holiday and Smart for Porzingis, the breakout year from Derek White, which has seen the bald Mamba elevate into an elite shot creator, D. White and Al Horford still being damn versatile on both ends, and Peyton Pritchard sparking the bench unit have all given the Celtics a formidable supporting cast. However, historically speaking, in the NBA playoffs and under pressure moments in basketball generally, the outcome always depends on the battle of each team's superstars. Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown have been first and second options on teams that have consistently dominated regular seasons for the past seven years. The narrative with this Jays-led Celtics team is that they've tried and failed to come through under the bright lights time and time again. Because not including this year, since 2017-18, Boston's made a combined four trips to either the conference or NBA finals and have come out on the other end without a championship ring to show for it. The way they lost makes that fact much worse. Now don't get me wrong, Tatum and Brown are top players in this league who've had incredibly impressive young careers. They don't deserve all the criticism they've gotten. All I'm saying is, when we get to this stage, the very biggest stage, meaning either rounds 3 or 4 in late May or early to mid-June. We've seen what happens with them in the past against the toughest caliber of opponents, not just once, twice, or thrice, but four different times. 
That's exactly why Boston has so much to prove in the 2024 NBA Finals. Just think of how Stephen Curry did them in 2022. Think of how they let Jimmy Butler take ownership of their franchise in both 2020 and 2023's Conference Final. Those three years could have easily been three titles for Boston. But when an NBA core of talent led by the same players has made it this far this many times and failed this many times, I'm viewing Boston as the underdog in this series because of that. Still, as of this recording, we have yet to see Tatum and Brown prove they can be a championship duo. Even as a Raptors fan, I wouldn't mind seeing Tatum and Brown win the chip. My Raptors lost to them four years ago in 2020's Eastern Conference Semifinals, in a series that went seven and right down to the wire in Game 7. In that series, Jason and Jalen didn't even have the greatest numbers, but their potential as a duo was made clear to me after Toronto took the L. Boston's duo showed up when it needed to and made big shots that I can vividly remember killing my hometown squad. I believed from that point on that Tatum and Brown would eventually win a championship. Tatum's run through the Eastern Conference two years later would validate that point. Brown's run this year has been similar to what Jason did in 2022, but generally, the comparisons between these two have been utterly toxic and shouldn't even be happening in the first place, given they are two completely different players with two completely different mentalities, heatedly responding to the very first clip in today's video from Mike Greenberg's Get Up, which blatantly attempted to split up Tatum and Brown, Joe Mazzulla would go in depth answering that question without holding back the slightest bit. Jalen and Jason, their relationship, the obvious like, kind of like tension of just wanting to be the best, becomes this narrative for so many talking heads around the country or world. From your perspective, does that seem far-fetched? And I guess just what has it been like your experience with these guys over the last few years? And That's how a really good question. I'm kind of praying about how deep I really want to get into that because the whole thing about that really pisses me off. And I think it's unfair to both of them. And I think it's stupid that people have to use... Uh, those two guys' names and use information that they don't know to create clickbait so that they could stay relevant. And it's very unfair that those two get compared. They're two, like, two completely different people. They're two completely different players. They're great teammates. They love each other and they go about winning and they go about their process in a different way. So uh, why they have to always be lumped together I think is unfair and people just use it for their own relativity. Um, and at the end of the day, like uh, those two guys, their relationship is their relationship. They love each other, they push each other every single day in practice, they communicate with each other, but they go about winning differently. And um, I think they're both getting unfair, um, uh, what's the word, like being compared to each other. They're different. And um, you see other duos around the league don't have to go through that. And it's because uh, of the platform that they have. It's because they've been so successful their entire careers. Uh, they've been able to, to long stand success at a high, high level. And uh, so people need them in order to stay relevant. And uh, they should not talk on speculation. They should get to know them as people before they talk about that stuff. They're two of the greatest teammates and players that you could have. And it's been an honor to coach both of them. It doesn't mean they have to be the same. And so it's bullshit. And I love both of them, and they deserve better. Who wins between Boston and Dallas, and in how many games? Best answer gets next video shout out. Today's shout out goes to Boston Haltane, who says, That first quarter should have been the moment I realized the game was over. Luka's shot making was incredible, and then Rudy Gobert taking seven field goals in the first. That's not the recipe to win in the NBA. Thanks to Boston for that take, 